Can thine heart endure, or can thine hands be strong? In the days that I shall deal with thee, I, the Lord, have spoken it, and will do it. In a former part of this chapter, we have a dreadful catalog of the sins of Jerusalem, as you may see from the first to the thirteenth verse. In the thirteenth, which is the verse preceding the text, God manifests his great displeasure and fearful wrath against them for those their iniquities. Behold, I have smitten mine hand at thy dishonest gain, which thou hast made, and at thy blood which has been in the midst of thee. The expression of God smiting his hand signifies the greatness of his anchor, and is preparing himself, as it were, to execute wrath answerable to their heinous crimes. It is an allusion to what we sometimes see in men when they are surprised by seeing or hearing of some horrid offense or most intolerable injury, which very much stirs their spirits and animates them with high resentment. On such an occasion they will rise up in wrath and smite their hands together as an expression of the heat of their indignation and full resolution to be avenged on those who have committed the injury, as in chapter 21, verse 7. I will also smite mine hands together, and I will cause my fury to rest, I the Lord have said it. Then in the text, the punishment of that people is represented number one. The nature of their punishment is more generally represented in that therein God will undertake to deal with them. God here threatens to deal with the sinners in Jerusalem. The prophets could do nothing with them. God had sent them one after another. But those sinners were too strong for them, and beat one and killed another. Therefore now God himself undertakes to deal with them. Number two. Their punishment is more particularly represented in three things, namely, the intolerableness, the remedilessness, and the unavoidableness of it. First, the intolerableness of it. Can thine heart endure? The remedilessness, or the impossibility of their doing anything for their own relief, number two. And can thine hands be strong, number three. The unavoidableness of it. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and will do it. Doctrine Since God has undertaken to deal with impenitent sinners, they shall neither shun the threatened misery, nor deliver themselves out of it, nor can they bear it. In handling this doctrine I shall first show what is implied in God's undertaken to deal with impenitent sinners. Secondly, that therefore they cannot avoid punishment. Number three, that they cannot in any measure deliver themselves from it, or do anything for their own relief under it. Number four, that they cannot bear it. Number five, I shall answer an inquiry and then proceed to the application. Number one, I shall show what is implied in God's undertaken to deal with them penitent sinners. Others are not able to deal with them. They baffle all the means used with them by those that are appointed to teach and to rule over them. They will not yield to parents or to the council's warning or reproofs of pastors. They prove obstinate and stiff-hearted. Therefore God undertakes to deal with them. This implies the following things. Number one, that God will reckon with them and take of them satisfaction to his justice. In this world, God puts forth his authority to command them and to require subjection to him. In his commands, he is very positive, strictly requiring of them the performance of such and such duties, and is positively forbidding such and such things which were contrary to their duty. But they have no regard to these commands. God continues commanding, and they continue rebelling. They make nothing of God's authority. God threatens, but they despise his threatening. They make nothing of dishonoring God. They care not how much their behavior is to the dishonor of God. He offers them mercy if they will repent and return, but they despise his mercy as well as his wrath. God calls, but they refuse. Thus, they are continually plunging themselves deeper and deeper in debt. And at the same time, imagine they shall escape the payment of the debt and design entirely to rob God of his due. 
But God has undertaken to right himself. He will reckon with them. He has undertaken to see that the debts due to him are paid. All their sins are written in his book. Not one of them is forgotten, and every one must be paid. If God be wise enough and strong enough, he will have full satisfaction. He will exact the very uttermost farthing. He undertakes it as his part, as what belongs to him, to see himself righted, wherein he has been wronged. Deuteronomy 32, verse 35. To me belongeth vengeance. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. Number two. He has undertaken to vindicate the honor of his majesty. His majesty they despise. They hear that he is a great God, but they despise his greatness. They look upon him worthy of contempt and treat him accordingly. They hear of him by the name of a great king, but his authority they regard not, and sometimes trample upon it for years together. But God has not left the honor of his majesty wholly to their care. Though they now trample it in the dust, yet that is no sign that it will be finally lost. If God had left it wholly in their hands, it would indeed be lost. But God does not leave his honor and his glory with his enemies. It is too precious in his eyes to be so neglected. He has reserved the care of it to himself. He will see to it that his own injured majesty is vindicated. If the honor of God upon which sinners trample finally lie in the dust, then it will be because he is not strong enough to vindicate himself. He has sworn that great oath in Numbers 14, 2. As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Sinners despise his son and trample him under their feet. But he will see, if he cannot make the glory of his son appear, with respect to them, that all the earth may know how evil a thing it is to despise the Son of God. God intends that all men and angels, all heaven and all earth, shall see whether he be sufficient to magnify himself upon sinners who now despise him. He intends that the issue of things with respect to them shall be open, that all men may see it. Number three. He has undertaken to subdue impenitent sinners. Their hearts, while in this world, are very unsubdued. They lift up their heads and conduct themselves very proudly and contemptuously, and often sin with an high hand. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues walk through the earth. They practically say, as Pharaoh did, Who is the Lord? I know not the Lord, neither will I obey his voice. Job 21, 41 they say to God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Some who cover their sin with specious show, who put on a face of religion and a demure countenance and behavior, yet have the spirit secretly reigning in their breasts. Notwithstanding all their fair show and good external carriage, they despise God in their hearts and have the weapons of war about them, though they are secret enemies and carry their swords under their skirts. They have most proud, stubborn, and rebellious hearts, which are ready to rise in opposition, to contend with him, and to find fault with his dispensations. Their hearts are full of pride, enmity, stubbornness, and blasphemy, which work in them many ways while they sit under the preaching of the word, and while the Spirit of God is striving with them, and they always continue to oppose and resist God as long as they live in the world. They never lay down the weapons of their rebellion. But God has undertaken to deal with them and to subdue them. And those proud and stubborn hearts which will not yield to the power of God's word shall be broken by the power of his hand. If they will not be willing subjects to the golden scepter and will not yield to the attractives of his love, they shall be subject to the force of the iron rod, whether they will or not. Them that proudly set up their own righteousness and their own wills against God, God has undertaken to bring down, and without doubt it will be done. He has undertaken to make those who are now regardless of God regard him. They shall know that he is Jehovah. Now they will not own that he is the Lord, but they shall know it. Isaiah 26, 11. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see. 
Now wicked men not only hate God, but they slight him. They are not afraid of him, but he will subdue their contempt. When he shall come to take them in hand, they will hate him still, but they will not slight him. They will not make light of his power as they now do. They will see and feel too much of the infinity of his power to slight it. They are now wont to slight his wrath, but then they will slight it no more. They will be infinitely far from it. They will find by sufficient experience that his wrath is not to be slighted. They will learn this to their cost, and they never will forget it. Number 4. God has undertaken to rectify their judgments. Now they will not be convinced of those things which God tells them in his word. Ministers take much pains to convince them, but all is in vain. Therefore God will undertake to convince them, and he will do it effectually. Now they will not be convinced of the truth of divine things. They have indeed convincing arguments set before them. They see and hear enough to convince them. Yet so prone are they to unbelief and atheism that divine things never seem to them to be real. But God will hereafter make them seem real. Now they are always doubting of the truth of the scriptures, questioning whether they be the word of God and whether the threatenings of scripture be true. But God has undertaken to convince them that those threatenings are true, and he will make them to know that they are true, so that they will never doubt any more forever. They will be convinced by dear experience. Now they are always questioning whether there be any such place as hell. They hear much about it, but it always seems to them like a dream. But God will make it seem otherwise than a dream. Now they are often told of the vanity of the world, but we may as well preach to the beasts to persuade them of the vanity of earthly things. But God will undertake to convince them of this. He will hereafter give them a thorough conviction of it, so that they shall have a strong sense of the vanity of all these things. Now ministers often tell sinners of the great importance of an interest in Christ, and that that is the one thing needful. They are also told the folly of delay in the care of their souls, and how much it concerns them to improve their opportunity. But the instructions of ministers do not convince them. Therefore God will undertake to convince them. Impenitent sinners, while in this world, hear how dreadful hell is, but they will not believe that it is so dreadful as ministers represent. They cannot think that they shall to all eternity suffer such exquisite and horrible torments, but they shall be taught and convinced to purpose that the representations ministers give of those torments agreeable to the word of God are no bugbears and that the wrath of God is indeed as dreadful as they declare. Since God has undertaken to deal with sinners and to rectify their judgments in these manners, and he will do it thoroughly, for his work is perfect, when he undertakes to do things, he does not do them by halves. Therefore, before he shall have done with sinners, he will convince them effectually, so that they shall never be in danger of relapsing into their former errors any more. He will convince them of their folly and stupidity in entertaining such notions as they now entertain. Thus God has undertaken to deal with obstinate unbelievers. They carry things on in great confusion. But we need not be dismayed at it. Let us wait, and we shall see that God will rectify things. Sinners will not always continue to rebel and despise with impunity. The honor of God will in due time be vindicated, and they shall be subdued and convicted, and shall give an account. There is no sin, not so much as an idle word that they shall speak, but they must give an account of it. Matthew 12:36. And their sins must be fully balanced and recompensed and satisfaction obtained. Because judgment against their evil works is not speedily executed, their hearts are fully set in them to do evil. Yet God is a righteous judge. He will see that judgment is executed in due time. I come now. Number two. To show that therefore impenitent sinners shall not avoid their due punishment. God has undertaken to inflict it. He is engaged to do it. He takes it as 
his work is what properly belongs to him, and we may expect it of him. If he has sworn by his life that he will do it, and if he has power sufficient, if he is a living God, doubtless we shall see it done and that God has declared that he will punish impenitent sinners, is manifest from many scriptures as Deuteronomy 32, verse 41. I will render vengeance to mine enemies, and will reward them that hate me. Deuteronomy 7, verse 10. He will not be slack to him that hateth him, he will repay him to his face. Exodus 34, verse 7. That will by no means clear the guilty. Nahum 1, 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. God saith in the text, I the Lord has spoken it and will do it, which leaves no room to doubt of the actual fulfillment of the threatening in its utmost extent. Some wicked men have flattered themselves that although God has threatened very dreadful things to wicked men for their sins, yet in his heart he never intends to fulfill his threatenings, but only to terrify them and make them afraid while they live. But would the infinitely holy God, who is not a man that he should lie, and who speaks no vain words, utter himself in this manner? I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. I have not only threatened, but I will also fulfill my threatenings, when at the same time these words did not agree with his heart, but he secretly knew that though he had spoken, yet he intended not to do it? Who is he that dares to entertain such horrid blasphemy in his heart? No, let no impenitent sinner flatter himself so vainly and foolishly. If it were indeed only a man, a being of like impotency and mutability with themselves, who had undertaken to deal with them, they might perhaps with some reason flatter themselves that they should find some means to avoid the threatened punishment. But since an omniscient, omnipotent, immutable God has undertaken, vain are all such hopes. There is no hope that possibly they may steal away to heaven, though they die unconverted. There is no hope that they can deceive God by any false show of repentance and faith, and so be taken to heaven through mistake. For the eyes of God are as a flame of fire. They perfectly see through every man. The inmost closet of the heart is all open to him. There is no hope of escaping the threatened punishment by sinking into nothing at death like brute creatures. And Indeed, many wicked men upon their deathbeds wish for this. If it were so, death would be nothing to them in comparison with what it is now. But all such wishes are vain. There is no hope of their escaping without notice when they leave the body. There is no hope that God, by reason of the multiplicity of affairs which he has to mind, will happen to overlook them and not take notice of them when they come to die, and so that their souls will slip away privately and hide themselves in some secret corner and so escape divine vengeance. There is no hope that they shall be missed in a crowd at the day of judgment, and that they can have opportunity to hide themselves in some cave or den of the mountains, or in any secret hole of the earth, and that while so doing they will not be minded by reason of the many things which will be the objects of attention on that day. Neither is there any hope that they will be able to crowd themselves in among the multitude of the saints at the right hand of the judge, and so go to heaven undiscovered. Nor is there any hope that God will alter his mind, or that he will repent of what he has said. For he is not the Son of Man, that he should repent. Has he said, and shall he not do it? Has he spoken, and shall he not make it good? When did God ever undertake to do anything, and fail? I come now, thirdly, to show, that as impenitent sinners cannot shun the threatened punishment, so neither can they do anything to deliver themselves from it, or to relieve themselves under it. This is implied in those words of the text, Can thine hand be strong? It is with our hands that we make and accomplish things for ourselves. But the wicked in hell will have no strength of hand to accomplish anything at all for themselves, or to bring to pass any deliverance or any degree of relief. First, they will not be able, in that conflict, to overcome their enemy, and so to deliver themselves. God, 
who will then undertake to deal with them, and will gird himself with might to execute wrath, will be their enemy, and will act a part of an enemy with a witness, and they will have no strength to oppose him. Those who live negligent of their souls under the light of the gospel act as if they supposed that they should be able hereafter to make their part good with God. 1 Corinthians 10.22 Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? But they will have no power, no might, to resist that omnipotence which will be engaged against them. Number 2 They will have no strength in their hands to do anything to appease God, or in the least to abate the fierceness of his wrath. They will not be able to offer any satisfaction. They will not be able to procure God's pity. Though they cry, God will not hear them. They will find no price to offer to God in order to purchase any favor, or to pay any part of their debt. Number three. They will not be able to find any to befriend them, and intercede with God for them. They had the offer of a mediator often made them in this world, but they will have no offers of such a nature in hell. None will befriend them. They will have no friend in hell. All there will be their enemies. They will have no friend in heaven. None of the saints or angels will befriend them, or if they should, it would be to no purpose. There will be no creature that will have any power to deliver them, nor will any ever pity them. Number four. Nor will they ever be able to make their escape. They will find no means to break prison and flee. In hell they will be reserved in chains of darkness forever and ever. Malefactors have often found means to break prison and escape the hand of civil justice, but none ever escaped out of the prison of hell, which is God's prison. It is a strong prison. It is beyond any finite power or the united strength of all wicked men and devils to unlock or break open the door of that prison. Christ has the key of hell. He shuts and no man opens. Number five. Nor will they ever be able to find anything to relieve them in hell. They will never find any resting place there, any place of respite, any secret corner, which will be cooler than the rest where they may have a little respite, a small abatement of the extremity of their torment. They never will be able to find any cooling stream or fountain in any part of that world of torment, no, nor so much as a drop of water to cool their tongues. They will find no company to give them any comfort or to do them the least good. They will find no place where they can remain and rest and take breath for one minute. For they will be tormented with fire and brimstone, and will have no rest day nor night for ever and ever. Thus impenitent sinners will be able neither to shun the punishment threatened, nor to deliver themselves from it, nor to find any relief under it. I come now, number four, to show that neither will they be able to bear it. Neither will their hands be strong to deliver themselves from it nor will their hearts be able to endure it. It is common with men when they meet with calamities in this world in the first place to endeavor to shun them. Then after they are come, they endeavor to deliver themselves from them as soon as they can, or at least to order things so as to deliver themselves in some degree. But if they find that they can by no means deliver themselves and see that the case is so that they must bear them, Then they set themselves to bear them. They fortify their spirits and take up a resolution that they will support themselves under them as well as they can. But it will be utterly in vain for impenitent sinners to think to do thus with respect to the torments of hell. They will not be able to endure them or at all to support themselves under them. The torment will be immensely beyond their strength. What will it signify for a worm, which is about to be pressed under the weight of some great rock, to be let fall with its whole weight upon it, to collect its strength, to set itself to bear up the weight of the rock, and to preserve itself from being crushed by it? Much more in vain will it be for a poor damned soul to endeavor to support itself under the weight of the wrath of Almighty God. 
What is the strength of man who is but a worm to support himself against the power of Jehovah and against the fierceness of his wrath? What is man's strength when set to bear up against the exertions of infinite power? Matthew twenty one forty four. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder. When sinners hear of hell torments, they sometimes think with themselves, Well, if it should come to that, that I must go to hell, I will bear it as well as I can. As if by clothing themselves with resolution and firmness of mind, they would be able to support themselves in some measure, when alas, they will have no resolution, no courage at all. However, they shall have prepared themselves and collected their strength. Yet as soon as they shall begin to feel that wrath, their hearts will melt and be as water. However, before they may seem to harden their hearts in order to prepare themselves to bear, yet the first moment they feel it, their hearts will become like wax before the furnace. Their courage and resolution will be all gone in an instant. It will vanish away like a shadow in the twinkling of an eye. The stoutest and most sturdy will have no more courage than the feeblest infant. Let a man be an infant or a giant, it will be all one. They will not be able to keep alive any courage, any strength, any comfort, any hope at all. I come now, as was proposed, fifthly, to answer an inquiry which may naturally be raised concerning these things. Inquiry. Some may be ready to say, if this be the case, if impenitent sinners can neither shun future punishment, nor deliver themselves from it, nor bear it, then what will become of them? Answer, they will wholly sink down into eternal death. There will be that sinking of heart of which we now cannot conceive. We see how it is with the body when in extreme pain. The nature of the body will support itself for a considerable time under very great pain, so as to keep from wholly sinking. There will be great struggles, lamentable groans and panting, and it may be convulsions. These are the strugglings of nature to support itself under the extremity of the pain. There is, as it were, a great loathness in nature to yield to it. It cannot bear wholly to sink. But yet sometimes pain of body is so very extreme and exquisite that the nature of the body cannot support itself under it. However loath it may be to sink, yet it cannot bear the pain. There are a few struggles and throes and pantings, and it may be a shrink or two, and then nature yields to the violence of the torments, sinks down, and the body dies. This is the death of the body. So it will be with the soul in hell. It will have no strength or power to deliver itself, and its torment and horror will be so great, so mighty, so vastly disproportioned to its strength, that having no strength in the least to support itself, although it be infinitely contrary to the nature and inclination of the soul utterly to sink, yet it will sink. It will utterly and totally sink without the least degree of remaining comfort or strength or courage or hope. And though it will never be annihilated, its being and perception will never be abolished, yet such will be the infinite depth of gloominess that it will sink into, that it will be in a state of death, eternal death. The nature of man desires happiness. It is the nature of the soul to crave and thirst after well-being. And if it be under misery, it eagerly pants after relief. And the greater the misery is, the more eagerly does it struggle for help. But if all relief be withholden, all strength overborne, all support utterly gone, then it sinks into the darkness of death. We can conceive but little of the matter. We cannot conceive what that sinking of the soul in such a case is. But to help your conception... Imagine yourself to be cast into a fiery oven, or of a great furnace, where your pain would be as much greater than that occasioned by accidentally touching a coal of fire, as the heat is greater. Imagine also that your body were to lie there for a quarter of an hour, all the while full of quick sense, 
What horror would you feel at the entrance of such a furnace? And how long would that quarter of an hour seem to you? And after you had endured it for one minute, how overbearing would it be to you to think that you had to endure the other fourteen? But what would be the effect on your soul if you knew you must lie there enduring that torment to the full for twenty-four hours? And how much greater would be the effect if you knew you must endure it for a whole year? And how vastly greater still if you knew you must endure it for a thousand years? Oh, then how would your heart sink if you thought, if you knew that you must bear it forever and ever? that there would be no end, that after millions of millions of ages your torment would be no nearer to an end than ever it was, and that you never, never should be delivered. But your torment in hell will be immensely greater than this illustration represents. How then will the heart of a poor creature sink under it? How utterly inexpressible and inconceivable must the sinking of the soul be in such a case? This is a death threatened in the law. This is a dying in the highest sense of the word. This is to die sensibly, to die and know it, to be sensible of the gloom of death. This is to be undone. This is worthy of the name of destruction. This sinking of the soul under an infinite weight, which it cannot bear as a gloom of hell. We read in scripture of the blackness of darkness. This is it. This is the very thing. We read in scripture of sinners being lost and of their losing their souls. This is a thing intended. This is to lose the soul. They that are the subject of this are utterly lost application. The subject may be applied in the use of awakening to impenitent sinners. What has been said under this doctrine is for you, O impenitent sinner, O poor wretch, who art in the same miserable state in which you came into the world, excepting that you are loaded with vastly greater guilt by thine actual sins. These dreadful things which thou hast heard are for thee, who are yet unconverted and still remain an alien and stranger without Christ and without God in the world. They are for thee who to this day remain an enemy to God and a child of the devil. Even in this remarkable season when others both here and elsewhere far and near flock into Christ, for thee who hearest the noise, the fame of these things, but knowest nothing of the power of godliness in thine own heart. Whoever thou art, whether young or old, little or great, if thou art in a Christless and converted state, this is the wrath, this is the death to which you are condemned. This is a wrath that abides on you. This is a hell over which you hang, and to which you are ready to drop every day and every night. If you shall remain blind and hard and dead in sin a little longer, this destruction will come upon you. God has spoken and he will do it. It is vain for you to flatter yourself with hope that you shall avoid it or to say in your heart, perhaps it will not be. Perhaps it will not be just so. Perhaps things have been represented worse than they are. If you will not be convinced by the word preached to thee by men in the name of God, God himself will undertake to convince you. Ezekiel 14, 4, 7, and 8. Does it seem to you not real that you shall suffer such a dreadful destruction because it seems to you that you do not deserve it? And because you do not see anything so horrid in yourself as to answer such a dreadful punishment? Why is it that your wickedness does not seem bad enough to deserve this punishment? The reason is that you love your wickedness. Your wickedness seems good to you. It appears lovely to you. You do not see any hatefulness in it. Or to be sure, any such hatefulness is to answer such misery. But know, you stupid, blind, hardened wretch, that God does not see as you see with your polluted eyes. The sins in his sight are infinitely abominable. You know that you have a thousand and a thousand times made light of the majesty of God. And why should not that majesty which you have thus despised be manifested in the greatness of your punishment? 
You have often heard what a great and dreadful God Jehovah is. But you have made so light of it that you have not been afraid of him. You have not been afraid to sin against him, nor to go on day after day by your sins, to provoke him to wrath, nor to cast his commands under foot, and to trample on them. Now why may not God, in the greatness of your destruction, justly vindicate and manifest the greatness of that majesty which you have despised? You have despised the mighty power of God. You have not been afraid of it. Nor, Now why is it not fit that God should show the greatness of his power in your ruin? What king is there who will not show his authority in the punishment of those subjects that despise it? And who will not vindicate his royal majesty in executing vengeance on those that rise in rebellion? And are you such a fool as to think that the great king of heaven and earth before whom all other kings are so many grasshoppers, will not vindicate his kingly majesty on such contemptuous rebels as you are? Thou art very much mistaken if you think so. If you be regardless of God's majesty, be it known to you, God is not regardless of his own majesty. He takes care of the honor of it, and he will vindicate it. Think it not strange that God should deal so severely with you, or that the wrath which you shall suffer should be so great? For as great as it is, it is no greater than the love of God which you have despised. The love of God and his grace, condescension and pity to sinners, and sending his Son into the world to die for them, is every whit as great and wonderful as this inexpressible wrath. This mercy has been held forth to you and described in its wonderful greatness hundreds of times and as often has been offered to you. But you would not accept Christ. You would not have this great love of God. You despise God's dying love. You trampled the benefits of it underfoot. Now why should you not have wrath as great as that love and mercy which you despised and rejected? Does it seem incredible to you that God should so harden his heart against a poor sinner as so to destroy him and to bear him down with infinite power and merciless wrath? And is this a greater thing than it is for you to harden your heart as you have done against infinite mercy and against the dying love of God? Does it seem to you incredible that God should be so utterly regardless of the sinner's welfare as to sink him into an infinite abyss of misery? Is this shocking to you? And is it not at all shocking to you that you should be so utterly regardless as you have been of the honor and glory of the infinite God? It arises from your foolish stupidity and senseless. And it is because you have a heart of stone that you are so senseless of your own wickedness as to think you have not deserved such a punishment, and that it is to you incredible that will be inflicted upon you. But if when all is said and done you be not convinced, wait but a little while and you will be convinced. God will undertake to do the work which ministers cannot do, Though judgment against your evil works be not yet executed, and God now let you alone, yet he will soon come upon you with his great power. And when you shall know what God is and what you are, flatter not yourself that if these things shall prove true and the worst shall come, you will set yourself to bear it as well as you can. What will it signify to set yourself to bear and to collect your strength to support yourself? when you shall fall into the hands of that omnipotent king Jehovah? He that made you can make his sword approach unto you. His sword is not the sword of man, nor is his wrath the wrath of man. If it were, possibly stoutness might be maintained under it. But it is the fierceness of the wrath of the great God who is able to baffle and dissipate all your strength in a moment. He can fill your poor soul with an ocean of wrath, a deluge of fire and brimstone, or he can make it ten thousand times fuller of torment than ever an oven was full of fire, and at the same time can fill it with despair, of ever seeing an end to his torment, or any rest from its misery, and then where will be your strength? What will become of your courage then? What will signify your attempts to bear? What are you in the hand of the great God who made heaven and earth by speaking a word? What are you when dealt with by that strength which manages all this vast universe, holds the globe of the earth, directs all the motions of the heavenly bodies from age to age, 
and when the fixed time shall come will shake all to pieces. There are other wicked beings a thousand times stronger than you. There are the great leviathans, strong and proud spirits of a gigantic stoutness and hardiness. But how little are they in the hands of the great God? They are less than weak infants. They are as nothing and less than nothing in the hands of an angry God, as will appear at the day of judgment. Their hearts will be broken. They will sink. They will have no strength, no courage left. They will be as weak as water. Their souls will sink down into an infinite gloom, an abyss of death and despair. Then what will become of you, a poor worm, when you shall fall into the hands of that God, when he shall come to show his wrath and make his power known on you? If this ranks of all the wicked men on earth and of all the devils in hell were united in one, and you were possessed of it all, and if the courage, greatness, and stoutness of all their hearts were united in your single heart, that would be nothing in the hands of Jehovah. If it were all collected and you should set yourself to bear as well as you could, all would sink under his great wrath in an instant and would be utterly abolished. Your hands would drop down at once and your heart would melt as wax. The great mountains, the firm rocks cannot stand before the power of God. As fast as they stand, they are tossed hither and thither and skip like lambs when God appears in his anger. He can tear the earth in pieces in a moment. Yea, he can shatter the whole universe and dash it to pieces at one blow. How will then your hands be stronger, your heart endure? You cannot stand before a lion of the forest, an angry wild beast. If stirred up, will easily tear such an one as you in pieces. Yea, not only so, but you are crushed before the moth, a very little thing. A little worm or spider or some such insect is able to kill you. What then can you do in the hands of God? It is vain to set up briars and thorns in battle array against glowing flames. The points of thorns, though sharp, do nothing to withstand the fire. Some of you have seen buildings on fire. Imagine, therefore, with yourselves what a poor hand you would make at fighting with the flames if you were in the midst of so great and fierce a fire. You have often seen a spider or some other noisome insect when thrown in the midst of a fierce fire, and have observed how immediately it yields to the force of the flames. There is no long struggle, no fighting against a fire, no strength exerted to oppose the heat or to fly from it, but it immediately stretches forth itself and yields, and the fire takes possession of it, and at once it becomes full of fire. Here is a little image of what you will be the subjects of in hell, except you repent and fly to Christ. However, you may think that you will fortify yourselves and bear as well as you can. The first moment you shall be cast into hell, all your strength will sink and be utterly abolished. To encourage yourselves that you will set yourselves to bear hell torments as well as you can is just as if a worm that is about to be thrown into a glowing furnace should swell and fortify itself and prepare itself to fight the flames. What can you do with lightning? What does it signify to fight with it? What an absurd figure would a poor weak man make who in a thunderstorm should expect a flash of lightning on his head or his breast and should go forth sword in hand to oppose it, when a stream of brimstone would in an instant drink up all his spirits and his life and melt his sword. Consider these things, all you enemies of God and rejecters of Christ, whether you be old men or women, Christless heads of families or young people and wicked children, be assured that if you do not hearken and repent. God intends to show his wrath and to make his power known upon you. He intends to magnify himself exceedingly and sinking you down in hell. He intends to show his great majesty at the day of judgment before a vast assembly in your misery, before a greater assembly many thousandfold than ever yet appeared on earth, before a vast assembly of saints and a vast assembly of wicked men, a vast assembly of holy angels and before all the crew of devils. God will, before all these, get himself honor in your destruction. You shall be tormented in the presence of them all. Then all will see that God is a great God indeed. 
then all will see how dreadful a thing it is to sin against such a God and to reject such a Savior, such love and grace as you have rejected and despised. All will be filled with awe at the great sight, and all the saints and angels will look upon you and adore that majesty and that mighty power and that holiness and justice of God, which shall appear in your ineffable destruction and misery. It is probable that here are some who hear me this day, who at this very moment are unawakened, are in a great degree careless about their souls. It is probable that here are some who hear me this day, who at this very moment are unawakened, and are in a great degree careless about their souls. I fear there are some among us who are most fearfully hardened. Their hearts are harder than the very rocks. It is easier to make impressions upon an adamant than upon their hearts. I suppose some of you have heard all that I have said with ease and quietness. It appears to you as great big sounding words, but does not reach your hearts. You have heard such things many times. You are old soldiers and have been too much used to the roaring of heaven's cannon to be frightened at it. It will therefore probably be in vain for me to say anything further to you. I will only put you in mind that ere long God will deal with you. I cannot deal with you. You despise what I say. I have no power to make you sensible of your danger and misery, and of the dreadfulness of the wrath of God. The attempts of men in this way have often proved vain. However, God has undertaken to deal with such men as you are. It is his manner commonly first to let men try their utmost strength, particularly to let ministers try, that thus he may show ministers their own weakness and impotency. And when they have done what they can and all fails, and God takes the manner into his own hands. So it seems by your obstinacy as if God intended to undertake to deal with you. He will undertake to subdue you. He will see if he cannot cure you of your senselessness and regardless of his threatenings. And you will be convinced. You will be subdued effectually. Your hearts will be broken with a witness. Your strength will be utterly broken. Your courage and hope will sink. God will surely break those who will not bow. God, having girded himself with his power and wrath, has heretofore undertaken to deal with many hard, stubborn, senseless, obstinate hearts. And he never failed. He always did his work thoroughly. It will not be long before you will be wonderfully changed. You who now hear of hell and the wrath of the great God and sit here in these seats so easy and quiet and go away so careless by and by will shake and tremble and cry out and shriek and gnash your teeth and will be thoroughly convinced of the vast weight and importance of these great things which you now despise.